Hi, I'm Hendo at Cost Gear, and today we're covering 10 different ways to add unique texture to your EVA foam. This will include soldering, heat pressing, dremel carving, scoring, puff paint, stickers, and foam clay. We're covering both how to create the texture and paint it so that you get the most out of your foam work. All the techniques and materials will be listed down below, and I'm using the Cost Gear app planner to make sure it's easy to follow along with all the steps. So let's get started. So one way to texture your foam is with a soldering iron. A soldering iron is, of course, for soldering work, but in cosplay we use it to melt stuff. And we always wear a respirator. And in this case we're melting a scale texture into EVA foam. And this is our sample for that. You can see how it looks raw, sealed and primed, and painted. So to solder in this dragon scale texture, what I'm gonna do first is draw a sort of stencil outline. I'm starting by filling the space up with bigger circles and then filling the gaps in between with slightly smaller circles. I'm using a standard tip and the hottest setting for the iron. Start with the back or like a small space off to the side to kind of get a feel for it. You don't have to press hard at all for the melting to happen. Actually, the most important thing in this technique is having a pretty even speed. Too fast and the foam won't really get a chance to melt, but if you hold the iron there for too long, you're likely to melt a hole into your foam. So just find a good pace that works for you. You'll also notice the soldering sort of leaves this like jagged texture sometimes and you can go back and melt that down a little bit. Or in this case, I don't think it's gonna make much of an impact because of the way I'm gonna paint it. All these little cracks are gonna be a pretty dark color anyway. And it kind of adds to like an uneven organic type of texture. Once you finish soldering in your pattern, you can go ahead and heat seal it, seal it with something like Plasti Dip or Flex Bond, and then go ahead and prime it. I'm gonna add a bit of blue to the cracks here and a little bit of purple. Then I'm adding a darker purple base to the scales. And this is actually more pink than I was going for, so I'm brushing another layer of purple right on top. And then here's a dark wash to sort of like deepen and tone up those cracks again. And ooh, purple scales. This is very much like a lizard or like how to train your dragon type of texture. I think it's really cute and really pops. Another way to texture your foam is with heat pressing. For heat pressing, we'll have two examples, and the first one here is with aluminum foil. And this is how it looks raw, sealed and primed, and painted. The heat pressing technique is exactly what it sounds like. You're gonna heat the surface of your EVA foam and then press a texture into it. Pressing an aluminum foil is actually a really great way to get authentic looking leather. And that's especially useful for things like belts and straps and accessories. So first things first, I'm heating up this swatch of foam. Then I'm crinkling up the foil and pressing it into the surface and pushing it into a couple other places too. Now I'm heating up the bottom of the swatch, which is unfortunately gonna affect some of the texture I just made. That's not necessarily a bad thing. The more that you work the foam, the more authentic it's gonna look, and if you feel like you kinda didn't do a great job last time, you can just heat it up and try it again. And same thing for the top. I'm finding that leaving the foil pretty like jagged and not too crinkled, and then pressing it in really gets those like pointy bits in there. And after a bit, I used my brain and realized I could just cover the parts I had already done with another piece of foam so that it doesn't get heated up and doesn't lose its texture that I just made. And that was kind of a game changer, so I just keep repeating this process until it looks properly leathery. You can also use like a regular iron with this technique. I just think that balling up this way gives a little bit more variety and depth. If I was gonna do a really big area of leather, maybe I would do the hot iron thing. Then I've sealed the foam in light sprayed coats to make sure I don't lose any of that texture. Although you can just paint acrylic right on there if you're in a hurry. Once again, I have a layer of black just to really help me paint the shadows. And now I'm starting with my darkest shade of brown and just dabbing it all over. And I'm adding a couple other colors just to kind of give it some environmental damage. Then it gets a nice dark wash, which is just watered down black acrylic paint. And this is really what's gonna make the texture pop. It's already added like a couple years of wear and tear. And then finally a layer of a little bit of a lighter shade of brown. And now you have some nice cruelty-free leather. Our second heat pressing technique is with this 3D printed stamping block. And you can see what that looks like raw, sealed and primed, and painted. This works the same way as with the aluminum foil. You're gonna heat up the surface, but spend a little bit more time making sure that your pattern lines up. This technique works best on a flat surface, so if you're gonna add this pattern to armor, I would do that to the pieces first before you assemble them. I'm using another piece of foam to protect the parts that I've already stamped to make sure they don't get heated up and lose their shape. 
This is a little exhausting depending on the size of your stamp and your strength, but overall the process is really satisfying. This block is from a file available on the Cost Gear app, but you can get lots of different textures online too. And you can honestly use any sturdy patterned material like rolling pins or die cut stamps. So after sealing and priming, it's time to paint. I did this chromatic blue layer in my garage and am not really sure it needs anything else. So I think I'm gonna leave it as is. It looks really good. Puff paint can also be a great way to texture your foam. Here's our example with it raw, sealed and primed, and painted. I've mapped out this like art deco Gatsby looking design and I'm just gonna go over that with the puff paint. Doesn't matter what color you used, it's gonna be covered anyway. You wanna be a little bit mindful of your hand placement so you don't smear any of the paint. Try to go from one side to the other smoothly so that you're not making your job more difficult for yourself. You're also gonna want some pretty thick lines. After the sealing and priming process, you're gonna lose some of the detail, so you wanna make sure that it's thick enough to really show through. Overall, this is a bit of a tricky technique because you kinda of have to have an even hand and it's hard to get the lines super even and thick. It doesn't leave a lot of room for mistakes, but you can check out the Spidey community for cool tutorials on how to better use puff paint. They have been doing it for their webs for years and are absolute pros. You can't really use a heat gun on the whole thing to dry it completely, so it tends to burn the paint, but I am gonna use a little bit of the heat gun just to sort of dry the edges so that it doesn't slip or smear or shift around when I move it. Of course, the next step is to seal and prime, and I've done this black glossy base layer. Of course, it looks really good just with like a metal design, especially for a filigree look, but I wanna add gold lines on here and complete that art deco look. Just kidding, my puff paint lines weren't quite pronounced enough or even enough for the brushing technique I was using to work, so the whole thing is gold now gold now. Yeah, still neat. Like I said, this is a kind of a harder technique, at least for me. I really like to have straight, even lines, and I have a hard time accomplishing that with puff paint, but if I was just doing like little filigree things, I think this would be great. And I've seen a lot of other people do it much better than I have. A great way to get a filigree texture or any other kind of texture is with stickers, especially for like filigree in the corners or just some small details. This is so quick and easy, though it can get a little bit expensive. And here's the example raw, sealed and primed, and painted. So for this swatch, I'm just gonna add these stickers to the whole thing, spacing them out a little bit more so that it covers the whole surface. I should note that regular stickers won't cut it. You're gonna need these slightly embossed, like three-dimensional stickers, or like those puffy scrapbooking ones. The sticker adhesive might not be strong enough to hold it on its own, so you might wanna have some super glue nearby just to help out with that, especially if the stickers are going on a curved surface. So yeah, just placing them all over, it's actually pretty cathartic and fun. Once all the stickers are on there, I'm gonna go ahead and give it another press and kind of try and shift them around, see if anything comes loose, add super glue to whatever's needed, and then I'm gonna go ahead and seal it. This time I'm using Flex Bond, which is like a clear craft glue or Mod Podge basically. This would be easier with a bigger brush, but I just have this little one, it's fine. Just avoid leaving too many brush strokes behind. You can see that the glue separates a little bit on these wider parts of this plastic sticker, so I just have to go a little bit slower and do a couple layers to make sure the glue gets on there. I did about two layers and I'm gonna help the rest dry along with a little love from the heat gun. Flex Bond cures clear, so it's really easy to tell when it's ready. And after sealing and priming, I sprayed some antique silver spray paint on this whole bottom part. And I did that at a slight angle so that the paint would sort of pool around the edges and really make the filigree pop. And I think it looks great just like that. Scoring is when you cut into the surface of the EVA foam instead of just pressing into it. When you apply heat to cuts in EVA foam, it'll actually a little bit melt and condense the sides, opening up the cut even more and making it more pronounced. This makes it really easy to ensure that line work shows up through any sealing and painting. I like it for wood grain especially, so I'm gonna start with that. This is our first scoring example, raw, sealed, and painted. First, I'm mapping out where a few of the wooden knots go and then adding in all the line work. You're not gonna follow this exactly, but it's really, really helpful to have a guide there. Oh, also if you're painting directly on the foam, don't use a silver sharpie because the metallic ones can tend to bleed through the acrylic paint. Not related. Okay, so now take your X-Acto knife or box cutter and trace over your line work. Do each line in one single stroke if you can, that's gonna make it look a lot more realistic. It's a bit hard to see from the camera, but when you're up close, you can really easily tell where you've already cut. 
and it's more important that you do it all in one go rather than following the line exactly, which is why the lines are kind of just guidelines. Now we're gonna open those scored cut lines with some heat. Make sure all your cuts are ready and you don't really have any gaps. You can really only do this part once. If you try to cut the foam after you've already heated the surface, usually the surface is a little bit too condensed and melted already, so it's not really gonna be able to do that again as effectively. I also like to curve my foam a little bit to help those lines open up and get all the heat in there. As the scoring is heated up for a couple seconds, you'll suddenly see it open up and transform. Once that's all done, I'm gonna flatten it again and let it cool. This doesn't give the foam a ton of deep dimension itself, but it is gonna make it so easy to paint and that texture is really gonna come through during that process. So seal prime paint time. I've done a black layer mostly because I don't have a dark brown spray paint and I just want something to really get in the grooves. And I'm gonna dry brush some brown, then add a dark wash to get in that grain and make it really visible. Wipe off any excess that's needed and a super duper dry layer of a tiny highlight color. And yeah, I like how that turned out. Pretty basic, pretty clean. It kind of looks a little cartoony up close, but it makes for a really, really good, easy to read grain effect from further away. This is our second scoring example made with some stacked razor blades. This gives sort of a burnished effect on metal, kind of when they're like polishing it, but it's not all the way smooth, which is kind of how Wonder Woman's breastplate looks. Very rugged metal. So it's really hard to get straight lines like this without it ending up being wobbly like wood grain. And one of the solves for this is to just stack some razor blades together. I think the first person I saw do this was Gladsy, so thank you Gladsy. Just be really careful, I taped all of the blades together just to make super sure they couldn't slip out and ruin something. I'm gonna leave this bare stripe in the middle of my swatch just to like demo some Dremel stuff later. But on the rest of it, I'm just gonna go ahead and take my razor stack and start scoring those lines in straight up and down. Again, do it all in one stroke if you can. Make sure you're pressing hard enough that every blade is cutting through the surface. And just do that all over. And then it's time to heat up all those cuts for a second, it actually looks like it's sort of healing and fusing back together, but after a couple seconds of heat, the lines really open up like magic. Okay, and in the middle here, I'm gonna do a couple of bonus things. One is to cut open a large groove, which is also used for things like wood grain and, I don't know, just other foam work in general. And what you do is you make a, I guess, sort of thick marker line, and then you're gonna hold the razor at like a 45 degree angle and cut along each side of the line. And if you've done this neatly, the two cuts will meet at a point grooved down in the middle. Hopefully you've done a great job and can just peel that thing right out of there. I did not so much because this is like my fifth foam swatch in a row, but the next one I actually did pretty decent. Another way to make the EVA foam surface look a bit more metal is to also etch in some rivets and bolts. And one way I like to do that is with a Dremel bit. Instead of using the sanding drum itself, I'm actually going to press the top into the foam. Well, it's actually gonna cut into the foam because it's spinning so fast. If I pressed it in, it probably wouldn't make as neat a shape. So this way is just easier. And now I'm cutting another groove and this one was way cleaner. And now heating this part up too, just to clean it up a little bit and heat seal it for plastic sealing. After sealing and priming, it's a gold coat of paint. I'm gonna add a metallic coppery red to mimic that Wonder Woman look. It's pretty hard to go wrong here because the texture that we have scored into the foam is gonna do a lot of the heavy lifting. So I'm just mixing this slightly translucent red color with some copper and painting that in. And with the gold underneath, it's still gonna retain that shiny metal finish. The metal paints are pretty hydrophobic, so the dark wash doesn't take a bunch, but it does get in the lines a fair bit enough to make the effect read. And then I've just painted it by hand on this stripey part. And now that's done. Very Wonder Woman-esque. Probably the most tried and true way to add texture to your EVA foam is with a Dremel or rotary tool. And we'll have two examples for that. The first one is this battered stone. You can see how it looks raw, sealed, and painted. I think this is pretty fun and beginner friendly. It's kind of hard to mess up this method. You're basically gonna batter the surface of this thing with Dremel tips. I like to start with a large sanding drum and start with the edge just to sort of practice tapping the surface and creating these little chip marks. The round shape of the sanding cylinder is gonna make it a lot easier to accomplish that. And I'm gonna move from the side to the surface using the same technique, just tapping that Dremel drum onto the surface of the foam and holding it there for various lengths of time at various angles. I use 
both the large and small drum just to give a bit of variety in like the indentations in the foam. If you're having a hard time reaching some parts, you can actually bend the foam back so it's a little easier to access. You can also try out the grinding bits for a little bit of variety of texture. This one has a pretty large round tip and I found it's really good for sort of scuffing up the foam but also smoothing out some of these feathery bits. It's also gonna smooth down some of the edges to make them look less sharp and more worn. Experiment with different tips. This one is really good for making little tiny holes and since rocks are porous, having little holes is just gonna make it look a tiny bit more realistic. And now it's sealed and primed. And I have this layer of silver spray paint on it just to kind of show what this texture would look like with metal. But I'm gonna cover all of this and paint it like stone. Stone often has an undertone that's a little bit orange or a little bit blue. So I'm gonna do both of those colors right here. And it looks really intense right now, but as I dry brush some gray layers on top of it, it's gonna smooth it all out and make it one tone, but still have those undertones in there. And then I'm dry brushing in some very light highlights. And the dark wash is really gonna make this pop. I love how this turned out. It looks really real to me. Our next rotary tool example is this carved bark, and this is how it looks raw, sealed, and painted. This one has a ton of dimension and tends to look really impressive and is actually pretty easy to paint. First, you'll want to stencil out your pattern. Remember that this is tree bark, which actually does look a bit different from wood grain. I kind of think of how a brain or intestine works, but you can also just look at a reference. And now I'm going over these lines with a pretty deep carving tool. This is gonna make sure I keep track of these deep fold lines and it doesn't get lost in all the chipped sanding we're gonna do later. Don't worry about roughing up the foam, we're gonna rough it up even more later. And now I'm going in with the narrow sanding drum and just going over these lines with a 45 angled groove. Don't worry about it wobbling around and stuff, that actually adds to the effect. You can also hold the narrow sanding drum vertically and just sort of drag it down. This is gonna be a little wobblier and hard to control, but if you have a tight grip, it should work out just fine. And I'm alternating between both of these techniques. I'm getting some of these feathery torn bits, but we still have more to go, so I'm not gonna worry about it just yet. There are some areas where the grooves weren't quite deep enough and I've lost them a little bit, so I'm gonna go ahead and add that back in. And I'm also gonna use the wider sanding drum just to add some variety in the size of the chip marks in the foam. And here's all of that so far. And now I'm also gonna do a grinding bit, which is gonna help sand down some of those feathered edges and just add a bit of variety of that scratchy texture. And here's how that looks. It honestly looks like a lot of dimension for how thin the foam is. Okay, sealed and primed and with a layer of black for the base. As always, I'm gonna start with my darkest layer for the grooves and then dry brush on some lighter and lighter colors until I have several shades of pretty realistic looking bark. I'm adding and adjusting as I go, letting the bark speak to me. I'm also adding a bit of gray to the surface layers of this brown paint to give it a tiny bit of a sun bleached look. And using a dark wash to get some deeper color into those grooves and make those folds really look dimensional. And now tiny bits of glue and moss because I think it's heckin' cute. And this is probably my favorite result from the swatches so far. Okay, the last foam texture technique we're gonna talk about is foam clay. And here's our little sample, raw, sealed, and painted. Foam clay has a lot of utility potential, but remember that it does take a while for it to dry, so you don't wanna do anything with too large of a volume where it's gonna take like an eternity for it to dry all the way through. Even these very little spikes needed at least a whole day to dry. You can also use other types of clay or even lightweight clay, but foam clay is just like kind of the same price and it's just a better medium since you're working with foam anyway. So I'm taking this small amount to make little spikes first and I'm adding some little bony grooves into the base. Also, if you don't like the placement of something, it's usually pretty easy to move the foam clay around. And if it's just not sticking where you do want it to stick, if you just add a little bit of glue or contact cement, it'll stay there good. And I'm adding more and more spikes until I'm satisfied. I'm gonna cover this whole surface with foam clay and just sort of give it an uneven, reptilian, crinkly surface texture with mostly my fingers. I'm blending my little pieces of foam together as much as possible, except for around the base of that spike. I really want there to be a nice edge so it looks like the spikes are poking up through the skin. I'm also adding these little tears to the foam because I think it looks cool and will add even more texture. And then I proceeded to place it somewhere in this room where my cats could not reach and eat them and I cannot find it so here's a brand new one. Okay, sealed and primed and now we're gonna paint. It doesn't matter if you start with the bone spikes or the skin, just remember that where those two meet, you're gonna need to take a little bit of extra time to make sure the painting is clean. 
But as always, I'm starting with my darker colors and then slowly adding lighter colors. A dark wash is gonna help bring out some of those craters and recesses and holes and make the bones properly grimy. You don't have to just stick to a black wash, you can also do a dark brown or some other color as long as it looks environmentally appropriate. And overall, I love how the color turned out. It's so cute! And that's it! Now you know 10 different ways to texture your EVA foam. There are a couple other techniques I didn't use, like some of the leather working tools, or a Cricut, or a laser engraver, but those are definitely valid methods also, and if you have experience with those, let us know your tips and tricks down below. You can also join our Discord to talk craft with lots of other cosplayers, and check out the Coscare app planner if you want to keep everything organized. Until next time, I'm Henta with Coscare, and we can't wait to see what you bring to life.